Welcome to the show. This week we do things a little bit differently because we're celebrating one year of the Africa Leadership Dialogues. We want to thank you for being a part of the transformation of the African continent, for sharing your views, for telling us what matters to you. We really appreciate the engagement. And on the show tonight, we're going to look back at some of our guests, people who've given us their time and insights and ask ourselves, where are they today as well? Let's start with Kosana Moyo. He was the first ever interviewee on the show. Let's see what he had to share with us some time back. Part of our problem with the development outcomes being disappointing, in my opinion, is that everything we try to do, almost everything, appears to me to be copied from somebody. There is nothing that is being grounded on who we are. Now, if we are not building our efforts on who we are, there must be an implication that we don't like who we are. And I think for as long as we don't like who we are, the chances are that we're not going to succeed. I think the probability of succeeding is going to be really, really low. Two easy explanations for this. If we, don't, if we copy from other people, we automatically exclude from an understanding perspective the majority of our people. So you and I, you've got exposure, we've traveled, we're aware of what happens from where these models are copied. So you and I, and the people we represent who are like us, the elites, you've got a fair shot at being able to manipulate these levers that we are borrowing from other people. But that's not where the, the center of gravity of the African population is. So why then are we excluding as participants in economic development, the majority of our people. Well, Kosana and the Mandela Institute for Development Studies have been busy over the past year. He's engaging right across the continent with leadership, with the youth and various other stakeholders, private public sector, and taking a look at what we must do to transform the African continent. Just recently, a meeting was held in Dar es Salaam where six former African presidents joined Kosana and a small group of leaders from across the continent to discuss which way forward for Africa. Well, now let's take a look at some of our other interviewees who've joined us on the show. Xavier Lukdeval from Mauritius and Arthur Mutambara from Zimbabwe. Now, Mauritius has over the last 20 years or so, developed a tremendous financial services industry, which has serviced a lot of the investments into Asia in the past, India particularly, but China and other countries. And now what we see is there's a lot of interest into investing into Africa. And really what we are trying to do now is to partner with other uh, of our friends, some of, the, of, of our friends in Africa, in, in developing double taxation agreements, uh, investment protection agreements so that we can also start channeling the, in, the foreign investments into India. You will never be respected as an African unless Africa has done well as a continent. You could be a superstar academic in America, you could be a superstar journalist in Europe, you could be a, an outstanding business person. You must do something to make sure you Africa the continent has done well. Your country, Kenya, Zimbabwe has done well. So that when you move around as a superstar, people respect you because your country has been successful. I'm emphasizing the idea of moving from success to significance. Most of these young people are very successful, but they're not significant. Xavier is busy continuing to work towards growing Mauritius. And as for Arthur Mutambara, the Zimbabwe elections were held in 2013. He opted not to run, but we did catch up with him in Cape Town, South Africa. This is what he had to say. How do you make sure that I have values? Values cannot be proclaimed. Values cannot, values cannot be legislated. They are built by social mobilization, by education, by leading, by example. Constitutionalism is more important than the constitution. The culture, the behavior, the tradition of respecting a constitution cannot be legislated. It is built over time. And Africans must work very hard 
to build a culture, a tradition, a value system of respecting their constitution, respecting their laws, respecting their institutions. And that, to me, will lead us to free and fair processes and where losers are able to say, this was a good game, I lost, congratulations. We've had some amazing women leaders on the show. Let's take a look back at some of their views, their insights into leadership and development and the role of women on the African continent. There's this narrative, consistent narrative, that Africa is on the rise. You know, how we have seven to eight countries that are, you know, economically rising um, as, as African countries in the world. I think with that narrative, we should also be questioning and interrogating. When we say Africa is on the rise, how do we really begin to translate the economic growth that we are seeing, you know, into the well-being of our, you know, of our constituencies, of our communities, of our people? Let us remove that hat of a man, mm -hmm. being a man sitting here because it's a man world, it's a banking world. Can we sit as a woman? Can we sit a, as a woman and say, this is what I experience, this is what my mother experiences, and my auntie, and this is what my daughter will experience if I don't put my foot down and sit properly on this seat of an executive of a bank as a woman. Let us wear the womanness and we can be able to do it. We are all these different nations not because that was the natural division of who we were, but that uh, others somehow came and divided up our continent. Uh, and I think that those who tend to think that there is no Africa or there is no notion of Africans seem to maybe not, maybe are taken in by all the difficulties that the divisions that were created, the artificial divisions that were created uh, have, have caused. And the good news is that actually gender justice brings money. It does. It's just that a lot of the people have not put the model there because they would like to keep it's the elite model of what they're going to do. So I would say popularizing the advantages of uh, gender justice. The middle class is coming up and I think a lot of Africa is rising is because you're seeing a capable people in Africa and therefore delivering very capable and practical solutions. I think when you look at even foreign direct investment in Africa has increased significantly. Just 10 or so years ago, we were at about $15 billion of foreign direct investment. Today we're at $50 billion and more of foreign direct investment. Then now you look, you overlay on top of that technology and you ask yourself, in all of these factors, even in, in terms of urbanization, why are people coming to, to the metropolitan cities? And you overlay technology on top of that, and you can see then how powerful technology is, and that's what excites me. Mm -hmm. Honestly, seeing that we are applying it to be able to actually grow Africa in terms of the key drivers that we have for, for transformational change. As a conservationist, I, I realize that everything I've studied for and worked for is worthless unless the message is adopted by people in general, from politicians down to children. And it's very clear to me that many people, wherever they are, feel that conservation and wildlife is something for the elite, for the tourists, and has no value to them. We need to be very clear in translating into language how important this wildlife is as a heritage and as a, an asset for Africa in general. I envisage an Africa and a world at large made up of individuals who are proud to be citizens of their respective countries, who are accountable, who are responsible, who are active agents of change, and know that each and every one of us, regardless of where you are in the world, your age, your gender, or your current situation, you have a social responsibility to change the world, to contribute positively to society. You have the responsibility not to point a finger at anybody else, but to ask yourself, what am I doing? And you have the responsibility to get up and do it. These women are proof that 
It doesn't need to be about affirmative action. We have amazing women in leadership across Africa doing incredible things. Uh, we've had your requests as well for different people to be interviewed on the show. One of those is Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. We want to let you know we're going to chase that up this year and we hope to bring you uh, her interview on Africa Leadership Dialogues. In the meantime, we'd love you to share your views on other people you'd like to see on the show. This is how you can stay in touch. To join our conversation, go to our G Plus page, Africa Leadership Dialogues, on Facebook, Africa Leadership Dialogues, on Twitter, at Africa LD, and on WhatsApp, send your video comments to plus 254-715-816-033. And over the past year, we've also dealt with matters of security. Let's take a look at what some of our interviewees have had to say about the security situation on the African continent. What I think the future is going to be is a rising Africa with occasional countries that slide backwards into conflict uh, and then have to recover so that the issue becomes not merely the weakness, the individual wars that are happening, but the response to those wars. And what I'm seeing is increasingly African countries and regions um, taking up the issue uh, in terms of seeking solutions. There is need to point out that uh, security sector reform, which is ongoing in our country, needs to include um, a broader uh, category of actors. For example, the immigration, which is a security sector institution, the judiciary, uh, the prosecutors and investigators. Uh, the military. So it's not just the police that need to be brought into this ambit of security sector reform, right. but everybody who is concerned with it, including citizens, you know, including us, the citizens, we have a responsibility and including, of course, the media, a responsibility to, to engage responsibly in counter-terrorism. A 40-year-old woman today in DRC who was raped at 20, has a 20-year-old daughter who's still being raped today. That's how bad it is, right? And any African leader that cannot start, you know, step up to the plate and say, I will do it. I'm ready to take up this responsibility and do what I can to ensure that Congo is peaceful, right? And that we start taking even minute steps to address the difficulties, the challenges that they have right, doesn't deserve to be a leader on the continent. I can say that without any fear of contradiction. I think for me, insecurity comes with poverty. If people are not poor, security will come. There are many other issues, but I really consider that poverty alleviation is the first thing to do to have good security in the countries. In Mogadishu, what we are trying is the neighborhoods to get to know one another. So we were, uh, it's, it's a an, an program that's ongoing. Every fifth house should know. And the police who, should, who would be working there should know the neighborhood themselves. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, the police cannot do it alone. Mm -hmm. uh, the intelligence, the security, they cannot do it alone. They need the public. It is the people because now if they share the information properly without fear, because it will happen and it, you are at risk, everybody is at risk. And I think this has to be a global issue. We say it's a global issue, but sometimes we leave mm -hmm. to, to nations to, to do it themselves and from neighborhoods. What we ask of the leaders of these uh, two warring, uh, or the two opposite sides, is give us um, safe, of, safe passage. Just let us be able to provide the medical care that we need, offer security to let it be that it's secure for humanitarian aid to reach the patient and for patients to reach the point of medical care. Information has to be provided. Mm. People have to share information with the government and they have to, they have to see the government. If, even we know government makes mistakes from time to time, but in, in terms of security, we, we have to stand by the government. And, and my last word, I hope that the Kenyan government will go after the terrorists wherever they are and keep them on the run so that they, they don't have a minute or a second to plan such an attack again in Kenya. It's amazing now that 
once there's been some kind of sense of stability, once there's been some, some way forward that is 100% as a result of regional initiative, now the whole world can't stop falling over themselves, trying to take credit, trying to say, now this is what we need to do, now this is what we need to do, now that's what we need to do. And like we told them in London, you know, at the end of the day, we all want support for Somalia, but never forget right, that us in the region must take control and must lead in that direction. Because ultimately, if that's not the case, and it is going to be plain and obvious to everybody that the reason they are now moving into Somalia is because they're seeing the potential of stability and their agenda is nothing more than a scramble for the resources of Somalia now that there seems to be some direction, but was never really the interest of the Somali people, peace in the region, stability in the region, security in the region. Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. Other critical issues affecting our continent, our health and education, and we've had amazing guests share their insight on health and education. Let's take a look at some of those interviews. The basic issue we have has to do with population health outcomes. Uh, the children are dying from preventable causes. Our mothers die in the course of giving birth. That's the foundation for any health system, uh, first of all, to address that. And what we're trying to do for child morbidity and mortality, diseases that afflict our children and kill them needlessly, that are largely vaccine preventable, is to ensure vaccines are available to our children wherever they are. Not only in the urban centers or children of the world to do, but also rural children and children from poor families. Every person, regardless of your background, regardless of uh, what uh, level socioeconomic status, has access to good access to good diagnostic and treatment and whatever kind preventive promotive service health service that is there as msf is also we also try to push uh, for innovation innovation is that today you'll come and i'll do a prick and i'll tell you you have malaria it will reduce that the deaths by by a quite a considerable number um, so what i want to see, what i would like to see uh, is where we can access these services whenever we need them. Mm -hmm. Public sector, I think their role is basically basic sanitation, water, immunization, all the primary care and public health stuff. That's where the government should focus on. Private sector should focus on providing services in a way that is accessible, affordable, and the highest quality, and perhaps to sometimes a different segment. Social sector, in my view, should fill in the gaps. Right, so we had a, an HIV pandemic, we have a malaria pandemic, we have a TB. Come in, help us fill in those gaps. But let's do all these three, uh, have all these three actors work in a coordinated fashion. And if we do that, I think we have a chance to have an ecosystem that then thrives and develops healthcare on the continent. Today, global health is changing every day. Today, yesterday it was HIV. Today is maternal and child health. Tomorrow it's going to be non-communicable diseases. We jump from one priority to another without achieving the first one. I must ask you before you go on, almost makes it sound as though it's, it's what's fashionable. It's what's the order of the day. Is, is, is that what it is? It's almost, it's almost like this because the global community, uh, you know, really want to touch to everything, but without really uh, finishing the, uh, the started agenda. Right. There is an unfinished agenda and we, they go from one way to another. Mm -hmm. What is the African agenda? What are the health issues that are priority for us? I always watch the news and I just had a little baby, my first little baby, and I turned on and saw these men and women in Ethiopia and children uh, no different to me sitting at home in Chelsea and watching their children die. In our world, a world of surplus. So to die of want in a world of surplus is not only intellectually absurd, it is economically illiterate and it's morally repulsive. Unless we created better leaders for Africa, there was no way we could actually become uh, a peaceful and successful and prosperous continent. 
So I thought, well, looking at the existing leaders, it's too late to try and change and reform them. We need to groom new leaders from scratch. You need to start from the beginning. Start from the beginning. Because it takes a lifetime to become a good leader. And so I thought, well, why not create uh, a school that will create, that will develop better leaders for Africa? There will be a billion young people under 30, uh, many of them still teenagers, who will be looking for educational opportunities uh, and also be looking for employment. And we've seen in North Africa and we've seen in the uh, Middle East uh, that when young people feel that they can neither get educational opportunities or even if they've had educational opportunities, can get employment. Because in, in Tunisia and Egypt, youth unemployment, 50, 40 percent. In, even in Saudi Arabia, it's 30 percent. Uh, now in Spain, it's 50 percent youth, youth unemployment. And in, where there is no opportunity, uh, the frustration of young people will boil over. Our educational system and even our culture does not train our young people to be critical thinkers, to be innovative, to be analytical, to be problem solvers. It's all rote. You know, we teach them, first of all, from home. We teach them to be quiet, okay? When elders are speaking, you don't speak. I mean, that is shaping the psyche of our young people. And then they go to school, and they're being taught subjects. And they're being taught to pass exams. They're being taught, they're not being given the skills that they really need to survive. Over, over time, more and more, the idea is seeping into ourselves as, new, as Africans to say that, look, we have to, uh, it's what I call the positive arrogance of Africans now. We have this positive arrogance that, you know, we can do this, you know, there's no reason why our colleagues from Latin America or from South Asia or Southeast Asia, what have you, are able to lift themselves out of poverty and we can't. There's nothing wrong with this. God has given us the same inalienable rights as everybody else and we as intelligent, we as you know, we're smart and everything else. So we need to take the bull by the horns ourselves and start doing that. And I think you're seeing more and more of that um, in the, at the very individual level and also through the, through the collective force of Africans who are not waiting for others to do something for them, but doing it themselves. If we are able to collaborate between employers and the educational sector and build the right kinds of partnerships, it'll be possible both for the private sector to cut the costs of their human capital development because they're getting people who are ready for the workplace and for education to very clearly convert into meaningful and sustainable jobs. But that requires us rethinking the idea that the university dons and syllabus setters sit in one room and the employers sit in another room. Mm -hmm. They need to sit in one room and say, what are we doing to give people the experiences they need over the duration of their life that prepare them for the workplace and create the workforce of the future? We're facing a situation whereby we have to change the mindset of young people from being job seekers to job creators. But the system has to be able to support the kids and the education system has to be able to produce that kind of mindset in the young um, graduate of today. And it's not, sadly. So my, my advice to young people is, look at what you're getting, but desire for more. And I've got some great news and update for you all. Two of our interviewees there, uh, Isaac Fukuo Jr. and Dr. Felix Olale have been named Archbishop Desmond Tutu Fellows. We congratulate them and we certainly wish you all the best in all that you do moving forward. Let's take a look now at some of the amazing young entrepreneurs we've spoken to on Africa Leadership Dialogues. We understand entrepreneurship as if it were something to do with trade. You know, it's like, it's like this dirty world that you use for traders because... It's hustling. It's hustling. It's, it's you know, hard life they of hustling. Couldn't, they, they couldn't, you know, go to school and get a PhD and, you know, be a career civil servant, so they became hustlers. I think that entrepreneurs is about innovation. It's about the ability to solve whatever problems we are facing with the resources that we have. I think that if we start understanding and realizing that there is a mission, that we must make sure that our people are employed, businesses are created. There are six million young people walk pacing the streets of Kenya, from university graduates to secondary school leavers. Maybe there are five million, maybe six million, maybe four million, but it's a large number. No government and no private sector can employ those people. It's not possible. So what do we need to do is to create an environment so that each one has a, a capacity and a possibility to produce 
a living at the end of the day. Look at that entrepreneur. It, does he have four hands, two heads, and seven legs? No. He's a regular guy like you. Look at this guy. The, is it the Mara group or so in Uganda? Ashish Thaka. Ashish Thaka. Mm. Well, I read the story uh, yesterday in my opening. At such a tender age, mm -hmm. he saw an opportunity and he moved it. He's not a genius. No, he's, he doesn't have two heads. He can think. He's using his brain. You must train yourself to hear the dew fall on the grass in the morning. Nobody is going to give it to you. Trust me. In my opinion, there are three key things that we've got to do. Right? We've got to, for young entrepreneurs and for women entrepreneurs specifically, we've got to enable them, we've got to empower them, and we've got to inspire them. Now, how? How do we enable, how do we empower, how do we inspire? From basic things. Now, when you took, look at a young entrepreneur, typically a young entrepreneur who wants to start business, either their parents are civil servants or farmers. Who do they go to for advice? They can't walk up to us on the street and ask us for advice. When I started when I was 15, I didn't have the ability to network the way I do today. So who do, I, who do you turn to for advice and guidance? And therefore, I think mentorship is one area which is very, very important. Farming is in many of our people's blood, right? Innovate around that, use proper irrigation methods. And if you have people back home, back somewhere who are sending you money, get knowledge rather than cash. Teach yourself how to fish and, and, and you will fish. There is a role for politics, but there is more a role for business. And the only way we can benefit our people is not to feed them with the more slogans, but to feed them with opportunities, generate partnership with international communities, and let them come and invest in Africa. From amongst our, our fellows, we found people who were ready, just waiting to go. They were at an inflection point in their life. They achieved so much success in business, in their professional careers, and they just didn't know what next. And we just remind them, you know, you're, you can do bigger things. You can do, you can serve others. You can help lead your community or steer it to a better place. And this is what fellows are actually doing. And it is amazing. And finally, the leadership challenge is not an easy challenge. We got some views one-on-one -on -one from Africa's leaders. Citizens, yeah, know that God ordained leaders. That leaders have to be fair, just, equitable, and transparent, and be ready to account to you and to God. But also remember, as a citizen, you have a role to play. You have a role to play because you have certain obligations. You have certain rights. I like the human rights aspect that we have been touting all along. But there's also human responsibility and citizens' obligation. And when the leadership does his own and followership does its own, we'll get there fast. To the people of Kenya and also to the people of Africa, what do you think they need to keep in mind in this new era? I think primarily the thing that we need to keep in mind is that uh, we were all put here for a purpose. And, and, and I believe that that purpose was not for ourselves to kill each other, but to work together for our mutual prosperity, for us to recognize that uh, uh, the prosperity of the individual is ultimately linked to the prosperity of, of, of the whole. And the only way we'll be able to achieve that is through working together, is through realizing that, um, that our problems don't come out as a basis because of our ethnicity or our religion or our nationhood, but rather an understanding that what we need to really tackle is poverty, lack of proper medical facilities, improving our infrastructure, ensuring that our young men and women have jobs. And once we tackle and focus on these issues and focus on them together, realizing 
that the only way to do so is for us to work together and to get an African solution as opposed to waiting for somebody to come and bail us out. I believe if we focus ourselves as Africans, recognizing that we are all here and our success, or my success is your success, I have no reason to doubt that within the next 50 years, Africa is going to be the continent to be looked out for. Time now for your views on the issues. What have you gained from the show and who would you most love to see on the Africa Leadership Dialogues? This week we sought your views on the show and who you would like to see featured. Gibson and Wade says, Great job! Every dialogue has been a challenge and an inspiration towards a better Africa. Hashtag leading young. Roni Banks says, I'd like to thank and appreciate the Africa Leadership Dialogues for the good work done, but would like the program to move among young leaders. To join our conversation, go to our G Plus page, Africa Leadership Dialogues, on Facebook, Africa Leadership Dialogues, on Twitter, at Africa LD, and on WhatsApp, send your video comments to plus 254-715-816-033. It's been an amazing journey uh, on the Africa Leadership Dialogues, a show that was inspired by my journey through the Archbishop Desmond Tutu Leadership Program and the realization that to grow the continent, we must start having deeper conversations, that we must profile and get insights from Africans who are doing amazing things in different sectors and therefore start to inform ourselves more on the possibilities and the opportunities that Africa has and offers to her people. I hope this journey has been a blessing for you too. And with that, I leave you with those powerful words we use at the end of every show. Blessings to you and blessings to Africa.